Oh, that's that's fine. Do what you need to do to get started. So okay, um, great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, those of you that are kind of sitting on the periphery, you might want to come on over this way because I'm going to be showing uh, pictures, and you might not have a good view from way off on the side. Um, this this actually is not my first time here talking to Orlando Kayak Fishing Club. Uh, when the club first started years ago, I had started the kayak fishing forum um, on Yahoo, and uh, and then I started to connect with other kayak clubs like Jacksonville Kayak and this club and a few others. So uh, so I I did a program at one of your meetings. I think it was two or three years ago, something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, my topic then, um, well, I, I came here, well, let me, let me first of all say this. I, I work for Everglades Area Tours in Chokoloski, and I am the kayak camping guide. I also do some fishing guiding and some eco-touring. I'm a, a certified Florida master naturalist, so I do nature interpretations. Uh, you see something strange and Likely, I've come across it before in all my years of paddling in the 10,000 Islands. I've seen some very strange things. Uh, so that's what I do. And uh, Everglades Area Tours is, is a, a founding member of Florida Sea Society for Ethical Ecotourism. It's a very good company. And uh, that's a good seal to look for uh, if you're doing any kind of a tour throughout the state of Florida. If you see that, it means a lot. Um, on the left there, you'll see my buddy Gator Dave, um, and he was here with me for the presentation that we did before, and the guy is a fishing magnet, I tell you what. I do all right, and I beat him in one tournament, but I tell you what, he finds the fish. And another one of my buddies that's one of the guides at Everglades Area Tours, Josh, I don't have a picture of him here, but He's, he's another guy that's like that. He's a fishing magnet. So if you want to find some fish, we can find some fish. And here, that's me on the right, and we're with Diana Nyad. Um, I was the captain of Diana Nyad's uh, uh, kayak team for her swim from Cuba to Key West. And uh, so I just have to brag on that a little bit. That's Diana uh, just the beginning of this last month, we were in Key West, and there's me standing behind her. Uh, they were dedicating this plaque to Diana. It's going on the seawall right where she walked ashore from her swim. And uh, and everybody you see there were all kayakers for Diana, if not for the final swim, for either for practice swims or one of the previous attempts. And there again, there's Gator Dave right behind Diana's face there. And, yeah. And my claim to fame, I danced with someone who danced with the stars. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, you know, there's nothing quite like waking up in the morning and looking out your tent flap and your destination is 30 feet away from you, your tent. It's a fantastic place. This is at Jewel Key, uh, one of many campable islands uh, facing the Gulf of Mexico in Everglades National Park. And um, um, if you want to book tours with, with us, with Everglades Area Tours, that's the easy way. Um, we have two different ways of camping through Everglades Area Tours. One way is like we did here, you can see the sea kayaks that are lined up on the beach, and we, we load everything that you need in your kayak, uh, and by everything, I mean even water, because there's nothing on the islands. Uh, some of the islands don't even have a porta potty in the park. This, this island, Jewel Key, does. Uh, so to make it easy, uh, my company provides the boats, the tents, sleeping bags, sleeping pads, all the food. Um, all you have to bring is yourself, your change of clothing, uh, your liquid libations if you want to do that, or 
whatever, don't tell me about the rest. Um, and I take care of everything else. I do the cooking, I do the dish cleaning, everything. I'm, I'm what my girlfriend refers to as the beach bitch. <laughs> so that's, that's the sea kayak trip. And uh, basically you paddle out from shore and then at the end of the trip we paddle back. But the easiest way is what we call a base camp trip. And in the base camp trip, we have 26-foot Carolina skiffs that have enough of a carrying capacity that we can load six 12-foot uh, uh, native ultimate kayaks in it and a canopy for the kitchen area, a four-burner stove, a turkey fryer that I use for boiling a Cajun boil, a uh, big 48-quart cooler, everything. It all goes by powerboat. We book an island with Everglades National Park. We get dropped off there, and then after we unload everything, the boat captain says, see you in four days, or whatever number of days you booked. And, uh, and there you are. You are at your fishing destination right there. So those are the two ways we can do it. If, if anybody is interested in knowing how you can do it all yourself, I did bring some information from Everglades National Park, and I can answer some questions about that, too. And, and if, if anybody has questions while I'm doing this, feel free to stop me, you know, raise your hand or speak up, whatever. And, you know, I'll... How far ahead are our reservations? I've, I've already got some booked right up into April right now. Um, but I've got a... Oh, there are what? There are a lot of spots. Yeah, a lot of spots. Yeah, my first my first camping trip of the season is coming up on the twentieth of this month, and then I've got a couple in November. I've got like three trips in December and a couple in January. They're already booked, but there are a lot of openings. Um, one of the things that that a few of us had been talking about before starting the program is the tides. And if you're going to do a, you know, roll your own type trip where you you do everything yourself, you really need to look at the tides, both outgoing on your way to your destination and on your return trip. You know, you need to you need to really look at how fast you can move your kayaks and what time of day you need to leave and stick to it. Make your plan ahead of time, because if you decide, oh, the fish are biting, let's just wait another hour. That turns into two, which turns into three, and then you're paddling back against the tide, and you're going to have a tough paddle. So if you're planning your own trip, uh, make your plan and paddle your plan. Uh, that's my best advice. Uh, there are places where you'll have standing waves a foot tall yeah you know where uh where you have water that's channeled down necked down into uh, a small area and yeah it it really rips yeah of course you know those are the things you want to look at on your way because you know you're you're going to find places where where it channels down and you know yeah exactly yeah they're they're going to be waiting so that's an opportunity. You know, you look at those things as you're going. Um, so let's see what I got here next. Ah, there we are looking out the tent flap right at the beach. I love it. And you can see here there's uh, three of the 12-foot natives. What you guys are paddling for your own boats, uh, you know, put these to shame. I'll be honest with you. But they're good stable boats. You can stand up in them. Um, you know, and then there's also on the right, the green one is a 16 foot tandem. The one on the left is a 14 and a half foot single. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're good stable boats. And uh, you know, this is not just something that the guys do. I take a lot of women on these trips. So whether you guys might be thinking of doing a club trip where five or six or eight 
guys get together and go do a club trip into the into the park or the ten thousand islands you can do that you can do a family trip uh you know um and if there's a few fishermen and a few non-fishermen if i have a group of six or more that justifies a second guide so um you know we get one guide that can take you and show you some good fishing spots and techniques that sort of thing and then the other guide is there to take care of the people that are the, not the fishers and there is a lot to do um, yeah this is a group of ladies that uh, got together and we did a sea kayak camping trip um, out to uh, picnic island and uh, we're talking a good uh, 10 mile paddling trip and it was to celebrate the 60th birthday of the lady on my right in purple. Yeah, so, you know, this is the, the women do enjoy this. This is definite. And this is a family of four that I took on a sea kayak trip. And the father, uh, Roland, he wanted to camp on the chickies in the uh, freshwater areas of Everglades National Park. He wanted to see alligators. And we saw alligators. And uh, the chickies are wooden platforms that Everglades National Park has built in the freshwater areas. Uh, because the problem with the freshwater areas is there's very few areas where that ground is high enough to have a campsite. So they built these platforms over the water with uh, a roof overhead, and there's a walkway to a porta potty right there. Um, and this this was a great experience. This was a great group, the uh, father and mother and the two teenage children. And, you know, of course, I get other bonuses, you know, being a guide. I get I get a nice view. Um, and that's one of our tandems. That's that's about a 21, 22 foot long boat. Very, very fast. If you've never paddled a big tandem sea kayak you know you you look at the thing and it's huge and it, you pick it up and it weighs like 65 70 pounds which i know compared to a lot of sea you know the fishing kayaks isn't much but yeah it weighs a, a bit but those things fly they really move the, the longest i ever paddled was with my girlfriend we took her big tandem and we did a 32 mile day trip and we were back by 2.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. And that's some of the uh, solo kayaks that we have. Rota molded, uh, nice, nice sea kayaks. And that's Picnic Key, beautiful white sandy beach. Some good trout fishing right off the shore right there. And very close to Camp Lulu Key. Uh, I've camped there many times and hooked into some tarpon over on Camp Lulu Key. This is what it looks like when the, the base camp boat drops us off. Uh, we Everybody gets together and helps offload everything and just take it up on the beach and set it down on the sand. And then we start setting up tents and the boat captain says, see you later. There's the kitchen area, the easy up canopy. And... Uh, and this was, I did uh, this trip to New Turkey Key with uh, a father, an octogenarian, you know, in his 80s, and his, his two sons. And it was a wonderful trip. That was a base camp trip. Um, the, the sons might have been able to do a, you know, to paddle out from shore, but the father, he was strong, but not, that, not quite that strong. And here's, here's our 26-foot Carolina skiff loaded up with, with all the gear. That's at Camp Lulu Key. Recognize that. And, it, and it's surprisingly quiet. Um, got these Yamaha outboards that uh, you can actually talk to somebody two people away from you without screaming at them. It's, uh, I love it. And that's a high school group that I took out uh, last season. Really, a lot of fun. I was uh, I, there were six of them that wanted to fish, so we were camping on Camp Lulu Key, and I said, "Well, come with me. Let's you know where we've got the tents set up is not so good, but there's a beach down this way. Let's walk over there." So I, I had set up six rods with uh, 
with trout rigs, you know, popping corks and DOA shrimp, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I was just showing them the technique, and I cast out. I said, okay, you cast out, let it settle, count one, two, three, give it a couple of snaps, and then crank, wait, snap. Second time I snapped at a tarpon grabbed it. Grabbed my DOA shrimp. And the six boys are all standing there watching me as this thing rolls right after it grabs that shrimp. And I, I won't say how long it was, but I will tell you from its belly to its back, it was that tall. It was a big tarpon. And those kids were just pumped after that. They wanted to catch fish. A lot of fun. And that's, uh, if you do leave from the uh, ranger station, this is the area that you leave from, right next to where they have their the rental boats. And uh, so right where you book the uh, the campsites, that's the building to the left there. And that that is the launch site. Um, and that's uh, my girlfriend on the left with the big yellow kayak. And we were, we paddled out to Pavilion Key that day and New Turkey Key the next day. And this is on Pavilion Key. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I am a uh, Florida master naturalist, so I'm always talking. I've, one of the things about guides, uh, if you haven't dealt with guides much, is we've all got stories. We've all when, I, when Chuck first hired me to work for Everglades Area Tours, I started thinking, how am I ever going to fill the, the spaces? You know, How am I ever going to think of enough things to say? And it's never been a problem. But I, I will tell you this, though, about the stories that I tell. I can back up my stories either with video or with pictures or with credible witnesses. And I've got a lot of stories. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> but, you know, you see a lot of things like this sea robin. You know, it's an odd-looking critter. If you've never seen a sea robin before, they've got little fingers on their pectoral fins. They look like their their hands there. Very odd. Find these in the in the surf line. And a horse conch. Yeah, that's the Florida state shell, and that's alive. Orange. Yeah, yeah. And these guys are the top predators on the mud flat. Every other shell on the mud flat is afraid of this guy. They're they're definitely predators. So what do you steal? Excuse me. What do you steal? Uh, well, people, but not so much anymore. But the Calusa Indians, uh, they used to chow down on them. Well, they're protected now, so yeah, yeah, chill. exactly. Yeah, and in Everglades National Park, um, we're not supposed to take any shells at all. Um, you know, that's that's just the rules. When you're in the 10,000 Islands, uh, you can take empty shells, not live shells. But the problem is we launch usually from the, the national park. So even though we were camping in the 10,000 Islands, we're coming back to shore at, Ever at Everglades National Park. So that, that can be a problem. So I, I take a lot of pictures. You know. And here's one of my guests with, with this strange curly thing that's eggs. actually do you know what that is eggs yeah 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 that's uh that's uh from a uh lightning whelk shell and when those things are stretched out the really big ones are over three feet long and each one of those those discs it's actually a series of discs a little bit bigger than a, a silver dollar each disc may have as many as a dozen little tiny baby snails inside perfectly formed when something that big comes out of something like that. yeah yeah the uh the small end at the bottom the uh the whelk attaches the egg case to something solid on the bottom like a rock or, or a big shell or a plant and then basically what it does is it crawls away and as it crawls away that long egg case pulls out of its body as it goes yeah. So a lot of times, you know, if we have storms, those will wash up. And, yeah, there's a little closer view. You can see the separate disks that form up the whole thing. But lots of fascinating things. And something as simple as a fiddler crab. A lot of people have never looked close at them. Look how pretty that is. 
but this is this this is the sort of thing that you know when I talk about uh, people that are non-fishers going on these trips, there is plenty <laughs> to keep them entertained. I guarantee you, it's it's a fascinating experience. Uh, uh, true tulip shell and uh, brown heart cockle. And uh, here Blanca is showing off some of her finds. And just everywhere you look, there's something. A little octopus that she found in the on the shore. That's a lightning well. It's also known as the left-handed well because when you hold it with the crown up, the opening is on the left. All the other conks open on the right. Ospreys. Yeah, if you if you have a good camera, you definitely want to bring it on one of these camping trips. You you want to have a dry bag so that you can protect your camera, but you definitely want a camera. There's so much to see. And ospreys, you know, there's one one section of Rabbit Key Pass that I, I refer to as Osprey Alley because there are so many osprey nests. And starting in uh, late October, they're nesting. And, uh, you know, right up through, uh, through the springtime, you know, when, they're, when their babies are fledging, that's a neat thing to see. That's one of their nests uh, on Pavilion Key. And roseate spoonbills. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty birds. Oyster catchers. This this pair took over ownership of the beach at New Turkey Key. And whenever one of us would go down to launch a kayak, they'd fly off. But as soon as the kayak was gone, they'd be back. And the white pelicans are just amazing. If you've never seen them before, they uh, they are so big, they make the brown pelicans look like babies. They have a nine-foot wingspan, bigger than a bald eagle. Amazing birds. An osprey with a sheep's head there. And there's <laughs> there's Shore, Shore Lunch. My friend Gus uh, Bianchi. And uh, a couple of small trout. There's a nice trout, about a 25-inch trout there. And that's another, that one I think was 25 and a half. I know you guys have some huge trout here along with your redfish, just humongous. I did one of one of your tournaments here a couple of years ago, and I, I had a 23 and a half inch trout, and I thought, well, you know, maybe that'll get me on the board. I think it was the ninth, <laughs> ninth biggest one. Yeah. And like I was saying before, the flounder in the 10,000 Islands and Everglades National Park you won't find them there as commonly as you will in this area here. But they are there. And it's, you know, a gulf flounder. And that's my, my boss, Charles, with a nice snook. DOA shrimp. Snook are always fun. You know, I, I, uh, I, I get people that have never fished in saltwater before and and they ask me about snook, you know, what do they fight like? I say, well, they fight like a bass, like a largemouth bass. They like to hit things on the surface. They come up and they shake their head and they tail walk just like a largemouth bass will. And I said, but the main difference is if you catch an 18-inch bass, you've caught a pretty nice bass. You catch an 18-inch snook, you have to throw it back. It's a baby. <laughs> Some more trout. That's a nice one. That's a rabbit key. And Spanish mackerel. That's Father Rick. I, I found out after the trip had started that he's a, a Catholic priest. And we didn't let the other uh, guests on the trip know until the uh, the last day there. And I, I, had, I let it slip. I said something like Father Rick. <laughs> what did you say? Really nice guy. And there's a black drum. And another black drum. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and while he was fighting that drum, he broke his rod shattered. It didn't just break, it shattered. And that picture there, that's him holding the pieces of his fishing rod. And 
Uh, I think somebody here said they'd been to Island Park Marina. That's where we are. That's the boat ramp at Island Park Marina. And this is at New Turkey Key. And uh, shore fishing for sharks in some, some places, some of the islands, is very good. And at New Turkey Key, it's particularly good because right next to your campsite, it drops off to like 10, 12 feet deep. And when the tide's moving, it's rushing right by there. And uh, Rick, the, the fellow at the bottom that's got his hands on the shark, uh, I had stuck a PVC pipe into the sand and put the fishing rod in there and just pulled out some line and just did one of these and threw a, a small jack out for bait. And, you know, I went out maybe 20 feet and dropped down. And he says, oh, let me get my kayak. I'll paddle it out. I said, no, no, you don't have to. It's, it's good right where it's at. Ten minutes later, that's what we hooked. And I, I did mention that I do the cooking. And I feed everybody well. You will not come away from one of my trips hungry. So this is a Cajun boil that I do. And I do it medium. You know, it's not hot, so it's not too spicy for people. If you want to spice it up yourself. And that's how I do it. So this is something, if you ever wanted to try that for a camping trip, uh, I get these mesh bags and I put everything in separately so that you know, the things that take the longest to cook go in first and on and on. And, you know, of course, if I'm doing shrimp, if nobody has a shrimp allergy, that'll be the last, that and the corn are the last two things to go in. And uh, that way you can also pick and choose what you want. And I, I did mention, you know, I'm welcome to kids too. These two were just this <laughs> really cute. And like I mentioned, it was her 60th birthday, so I brought a cake. But the uh, sun rises and the sun sets down in the Everglades and the 10,000 Islands just can't be beat. It's one good reason to have a, a good camera with you. Capture some of these scenes. Uh, mother and son enjoying the sunrise. Nice romantic spot for a couple. And, of course, campfires. Uh, yeah, she she found a forked stick and decided to bake her, uh, her bagel for breakfast. But, yeah, we, s'mores if you're into that. And that pretty well covers that. Uh, if anybody was a subscriber to Sea Kayak, or if you kept your magazines, this this is the article where I wrote the, uh, or the magazine where I wrote the article about the uh, Diana Nyad swim. So, all right, so that's pretty much everything, all the slides. So, is there any yeah, places that you go where there's cabins to stay? Um. There, yeah, on uh, on um, Chakalowski Island, um, give that thing a rest. Yeah, there's who was asking that? You, okay, um, yeah, on Chakalowski Island, uh, there's Island Park Marina, and they have trailers there. You know, with you know AC and kitchens and you know everything that a mobile home will have. Um, Charles, my boss, has a cabin in Everglades City that he rents out. And if the trailers and his cabin are booked, uh, if you just call our office and talk to either Charles or Heather, uh, they'll, they'll help you find a place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's good. Yeah. Well, for 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 camping, um, after after we're into the dry season a bit, uh, right now we're going to have mosquitoes and no seams. You know, just like anywhere in Florida. Um, but uh, after it's dried up a bit, the mosquitoes won't be you know, so prevalent. You know, they they'll taper off until finally they're just gone. Uh, but no seams. We're talking a beach area, 
So any time of year, there can be no seams. So uh, I, I always bring, uh, for my guests, I bring head nets, you know, and the best way to use those uh, is if you have your hat on, because that holds the net away from your face. And uh, I very rarely use the head nets myself, but sometimes when I'm cooking, the heat of the stove, you know, will, the CO2 attracts them, that sort of thing, and I'll go ahead and slip it on. But most of the times I don't. The worst times are at uh, dawn and dusk. Yeah, so those times you either want to have your spray close to you or have your head net or be in your tent, uh, you know, or near a campfire. Yeah. Um, but, oh, yeah, out on the water. Yeah, that works too, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a good excuse to grab something quick for breakfast and grab your fishing pole and head out. You know? um, and, uh, you know, when I'm guiding, I, I don't have a problem with people going off on their own, you know, as long as they tell me, uh, okay, I'm going now and I'm going over there, you know, that way if I need to go search for you, you know, I know where to look. Is there any self coverage out there? Is there what? Self coverage? Um, yeah, yeah, um, it's not always good, uh, but, um, yeah, yeah. It depends on how deep you get into the Everglades. When you get out to New Turkey Key, uh, it's pretty spotty. But even then, sometimes you can text message. And uh, I carry with me a uh, spot, uh, spot Connect is what it's called. And uh, it interacts with my, my phone, where usually with the Spot Messenger, you have... Uh, 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 91 or a help button which sends a pre recorded message to people on an email, and then you have the 911 button which calls out the Coast Guard, which is very expensive. So, with my Spot Connect, I can actually type an email on my phone and goes through the satellite even without cell phone reception, and it'll send exactly what's needed. Like if I've got uh, yeah, it's email. Yeah, yeah, it's email. Yeah, so, yeah, and all you do is you, you just download the app for your phone. And so you can send a message, but the problem is you can't receive a message. But at least, you know, for me, I have somebody that's there that can fire up a boat and come... Uh, bring us a repair part for whatever reason, or, oh, our propane tank leaked, bring us another propane tank or whatever. And, uh, you know, but I can't, I can't uh, receive a message. How far is that of a drive to get down to where you are? Um, probably about four hours, something like that. Oh, five, five hours? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, from New Smyrna? Okay. All right. So, and uh, there are other options for camping also. There's uh, Collier Seminole State Park, uh, which is on the Black uh, Blackwater River, which leads out to Fakahatchee Bay, which you can find your way out to the Gulf from there. Um, uh, but you definitely have to watch tides. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, right here is where Everglades City is, and the ranger station is right at that little red marker there. Um, Route 29, uh, oh, sorry about that. Should have shut that off. 
I don't know who that is. I'm just going to let it go. Um, so you take Route 29. Uh, it, it, it's an exit off of I-75. And then uh, you pass by Route 41. And Route 29 goes right into Everglades City. And then after Everglades City, it becomes a causeway, which leads to Chokoloski Island. And uh, uh, Everglades National Park is marked off by this blue dashed line. So everything from here way over off the map is all Everglades National Park. Um, some of the places I talked about, I talked about uh, New Turkey Key, it's off the map right about here. This is Pavilion Key here, Round Key. Jewel Key is here. Uh, Picnic Key is over here. And then there's Tiger, and then there's the Boundary. And Camp Lulu Key is the first island out of Everglades National Park. It's, it's inside of the uh, 10,000 Islands Wildlife uh, Refuge. And uh, um, with 10,000 islands, you can camp on any of these islands. And I've camped on most of them, uh, most of the barrier islands, I should say, not the interior islands. Um, and they are first come, first served. There's no reserving. Um, but then again, you also have the problem of uh, you get some locals that come out in their powerboat with five cases of beer and they get drunk and party until three in the morning and you can't do anything about it. Uh, whereas in Everglades National Park, if somebody is on the island and they don't have a permit and they're making noise, if it's after 10 o'clock, the rangers can be called out. And if the rangers have to come out, they're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. So they'll put a stop to it. So, but, uh, and I haven't had to do that, you know, but I'll tell you what, if there was somebody on one of the islands with a chainsaw and a generator and, you know, partying up and all that, I'd call the moment they fired up that chainsaw. I guarantee you. Um, but, uh, you sell your stuff to parts out of the Everglades City area? Well, that's, that's one option there. And for, my, for many of my sea kayaking trips, I start out either at Everglades City or I start out at Chokoloski. Um, but I have I've also done trips where I've started out, you know, on my own, not not uh, guided trips, starting out at Port of the Islands, which is right on 41. And there's a three mile long canal that leads to a natural channel. And then you can follow. Um, there are markers out that take you by Panther Key. And uh, there are a lot of. Uh, a lot of good camping islands. Uh, I've camped on Cape Romano, Brush Island, Gullivan, uh, Panther, Round Key, Camp Lulu Key, and then getting into the park. I've camped many places there as well. So you talked to mostly about the barrier islands. Is that because that's where you're camping, or is that where the fish and sport is at? Both. Um, yeah, the... Uh, as opposed to, say, the backcountry. The backcountry... Um, you're going to be camping either on chickies or on <clears throat> uh, ground sites. And uh, the ground sites, uh, you have to be prepared for the bugs because they're going to be bad, the, the, no matter what time of year you go. So you want the chickies? Chickies are good, yeah. If you want to be in the freshwater area, yeah, chickies are good. Um, the... Uh, the challenge with chickies is that they're still tidal, even though it's fresh water. And the tide will still move, you know, three or four feet, depending on, you know, depending on the date and all that. So if you arrive at the chickie at high tide, um, great, no problem. Uh, that's easy. You just pull your boat up and offload your gear and all that. But if you arrive at low tide, your boat is four feet down the chicky, and you've got to get your stuff out of that boat and up onto the chicky. Uh, it can be done, and I've done it. Uh, I've done it both on my personal trips and on professional trips. Um, 
but it takes teamwork, you know, and it takes a good balance. Um, and I, I have gone into the water. <laughs> it happens. There is a ladder, but at low tide, it's you know, it's got oysters and barnacles on it, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, they can be kind of helpful. But then again, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, the chickies are, are unique. Um, you know, the drawback is you don't have a beach that, you know, if you decide you want to go take a walk, you can take a walk. You can't have a campfire. So usually what I, I do is I'll bring uh, some of those citronella candles in a bucket and just put a few of them together and light them, and we sit around the, the citronella candles. That's our campfire. Uh, all you need is just a place to sit and tell stories. That's what campfires are all about. That's the best part of camping to me, is sitting around the campfire. You know? Everybody's got stories. Everybody. And if you, do, if you don't have any stories, by the end of your trip, you will. You'll have some. Yeah. Yeah, right in Everglades City, there's an airport. Oh. Oh. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I, I don't know personally. You know that uh, I know. Uh, you know, it's it's a small grass strip. Uh, oh, is it paved? Yeah. Oh yeah, I see planes going in and out of there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know anybody that does that. But then again, Charles might. You know, he's been there. You know, for a lot of years, and he knows a lot of people. You know, so uh, uh, got his business card here. And I thought I had mine with me, but I don't. But you can always reach me through through Charles. So, um, Did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Or did you talk about the bus or anything? Or um, if if it, uh, we we did talk a bit about wooden boat building before the meeting started. If there's anybody that's interested in in building your own kayak, you know, we can talk about that. Or if if uh, if anybody followed the Diana Nyad swim, if that's something that's interesting to you, I can talk about that a little bit. Other questions, or, or is there a main meeting and then not specific questions? Do you know? How long did it take you to build that? Um, I I I'd have to say in terms of hours, probably between 120 and 150 hours. Uh, I. You know, to say it took me X number of weeks really means nothing. Because yeah. I started it and had the hull complete, and then I got busy and I had to set it aside for a few months and then come back to it. And then when I came back to it, I decided not to do the deck in, in wood, you know, in plywood. I decided to do it in strips. So that added time to it. <coughs> oh, thanks. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, doing the doing the wood strips, uh, it's it's involved. It takes uh, a lot of time. Um, but uh, stitch and glue, for those who don't know the term, uh, you take plywood panels, and they're already pre-cut to the size and the shape that you need. And then you drill matching holes side by side, run wire through the holes, and then you twist the wire to draw the pieces together tightly. And you do that until you've formed up the entire hull. And after you've got the entire hull wired, you mix up epoxy, add a thickening agent to it that could either be something called cabosil, or it can be wood flour, very fine sawdust. Mix it until it's about like peanut butter, and then take a putty knife and put it in the joint. 
and you're cutting the wire off first. Of all. No, you put the oh, you put the wire on to hold the boat together. Then you put the wood putty mixture, you know, the resin mixture into the joint, and let it sit overnight until that resin kicks, hardens. So the wire still in there. The wires are still there. Then after you, after the resin kicks, you come back with the wire cutter, cut the wires, pull them out, and then you have to sand smooth what you did the day before, and then do it all over again. Put another round of putty in, fill the wire holes, fill the holes that you missed your first time, wait 24 hours, sand it again, and then by then, usually just a little bit of filling here and there. So after three attempts, you get the whole connection made. And uh, at that point, it's you have your hull formed and it's solid, but you have to handle it very carefully until it's glassed. And, uh, and you put fiberglass cloth on the inside and, uh, and on the outside as well. Um, and if, if you use cheap epoxy, uh, you might as well paint the boat because the wood won't show. Um, the epoxy that I used is, is West Systems, and it's about $90 a gallon for the resin and about $30, $35 for the hardener to kick the resin. How much resin hardener do you have? About, about one and a half gallons. And as far as the cloth goes, this is a 17 and a half foot long boat, and it's glassed inside and outside. One and layer each. Yeah, one layer each, and then... Uh, and then I followed up with another layer on the bottom as well. And you're using a real little thin cloth. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, like about a six ounce cloth. Yeah. So I can just make it into something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> though I, I, I did. I designed a, I designed a line of uh, skin-on-frame kayak kits that. Uh, uh, I had sold a few, but then kind of gave it up. It didn't really go. But those boats, uh, you could finish it in 40 hours. Yeah. yeah. And, and I actually, I, one of my prototypes, I, uh, I built the kayak in four days, and then on the fifth day I paddled it to Pavilion Key in the Everglades using, uh, <laughs> for the skin I used... Uh, um, clear vinyl, you know, like uh, like some people put on their sofa to protect the the good furniture. <laughs> yeah, 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 grandma, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was it was kind of funny because you know after I had loaded up the kayak and I'm ready to go, I was, oh wait a second, did I put that in? And I just had to look at the kayak. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> Because you could see everything inside of the kayak, but that was my five-day kayak. Not not on that trip, <laughs> but I no, I did. I poke. I took that boat um, down the Turner River, and uh, the Turner River is a mangrove tunnel. Beautiful place to paddle. Great place to go. Uh, but there are places where there. Are logs underwater covered with barnacles and you have to pull your kayak over it and i put like a maybe a half inch rip in the the vinyl going over one of those but that's all right i hit a sponge so i could bail it out all right well, thank you.